unbelievable because it's such a glamorous event and I spend all my time staring at other people's dresses. It's ridiculous. I can't like, I can't keep focused. It's the night when Hollywood's brightest stars mingle with the fashion world's most acclaimed designers and glamorous models on the red carpeted steps of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. All are gathered there to celebrate the art of fashion and to raise money for the museum's Costume Institute. The Costume Institute's first exhibition opened in 1946 as part of the museum's 75th anniversary celebrations and consisted of 18th and 19th century costumes. Since then, the Costume Institute has raised its operating funds through an annual event originally called the Party of the Year, what is now known as the Costume Institute Gala. Vogue magazine's editor-in-chief, Anna Wintour, has been instrumental in elevating the profile of the gala, making it fashion's most sought-after invitation. The event made headlines in 1996 when Princess Diana graced the opening of the Christian Dior exhibit, wearing the first Christian Dior dress ever designed by John Galliano, who had just been appointed creative director at the legendary French house. In 2001, the Costume Institute marked the 40th anniversary of Jacqueline Kennedy's assumption of the role of First Lady with their exhibition, Jacqueline Kennedy, The White House Years. Curated by Vogue magazine editor Hamish Bowles, the exhibition was one of the Met's most popular, drawing over 500,000 visitors to the museum. Visitors turned out in record numbers, 661,509 people to be exact, for 2011's Alexander McQueen, Savage Beauty, making it one of the top 10 most visited exhibitions in the museum's history. That record was broken in 2015 with China, Through the Looking Glass, one of the most expansive exhibitions the Costume Institute has ever staged. It spanned 16 galleries and brought in over 815,000 visitors, making it one of the top five most visited exhibitions of all time. Fashion is so inspiring and it's going to continue to inspire new generations and by bringing people who are intrigued by fashion and costume history into the museum, hopefully open up other departments in the museum that might be of interest. And now, a look back at 20 years of the art of fashion at the Met. In 1996, the Metropolitan Museum of Arts Costume Institute honored iconic designer Christian Dior. The opening night gala saw fashion royalty from both sides of the pond. Everyone wanted to catch a glimpse of Princess Diana's gown, the first by new Dior designer, John Galliano. But for the devotees of the old guard, the outgoing maestro, Gianfranco Ferre, did make an appearance, as did the queen and king of American fashion. But even the appearance of a handful of supermodels and their famous dates couldn't take away from the attention Diana's dress was receiving. Inside the museum, all eyes were on Dior. The legendary designer altered fashion forever with his new look. The idea of the shape, um, the tiny waist, uh, and the padded hips. The femininity. The romance um, has greatly inspired by flowers, his mother, um, very rounded shoulders, very feminine. Interestingly enough, the new look, as it's called, was not a new look at all. It was, in fact, very much a revivalist kind of look with a very narrow waist, with a great voluminous skirt, and with a pushed up bust. But all of that femininity was really something new after the Second World War because after the uncertainties and deprivation of the war, what Dior was offering was a kind of reinstated sense of glamour. I think what really stands out for me in this exhibition is the incredible sense of sort of luxury and opulence and also the sort of sophistication of Dior's cutting and um, sort of technical abilities.
One of the amazing things about the exhibition is that the span is only 10 years. Then what one sees is incredible embroideries, one sees capes, gowns, day wear. We've run the gamut from evening dresses to day wear and back to the most extravagant ball gowns. But there was a kind of virtuoso achievement on Dior's part to be able to dress the modern woman for every time of day and for every option in terms of life. It's been a long time coming and we just hope we're going to have a wonderful night in his memory. Fashion and rock and roll, they both been around a very long time, so it was inevitable that they meet. What your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. As 35th President of the United States, John F. Kennedy gave the country one of the most influential First Ladies of all time. From the moment she set foot on the campaign trail, Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy captivated not only America, but the world with her alluring beauty and understated style. The Metropolitan Museum of Art paid homage to Jackie with an exhibition celebrating the enduring impact of her White House years. It's exciting that we're celebrating the 40th anniversary of Jacqueline Kennedy's emergence as First Lady. For me and for those who knew my mother, she will always be a part of us and of our lives. And she will always grace the history she helped to make. She's such an icon and she had such a global influence in fashion in the world. I mean, so many women copy her and still going on. Visually, I think that probably there's no first lady who has so strongly influenced a period of the White House as Mrs. Kennedy did. She was a very modern woman, a very young woman, wearing wonderful simple clothes. What's fascinating about the clothes is that they really tell the story and one sees how very keenly Mrs. Kennedy at this period thought about the power of fashion and style and the messages that one could convey through clothing. The coat behind me, for instance, um, Jack, Jackie called her good luck coat because she wore it the day that Jack announced his candidacy for president. Here we have a prototypical pillbox hat. and She actually hated hats. She compromised and worked with her sales lady, Marita O'Connor, at Bergdorf Goodman, where the custom hat designer was Halston. On her travels, she liked um, broad brim hats. She would step off a plane, and you'd be able to see America's first lady. She knew the power of clothing. She knew the power of presentation. She had a, a real grace and a character, the way she walked, the way she moved. And that, that's as much about her style as her clothes. She was the ultimate of what class is, and yet she was approachable at the same time. Jackie was a sort of unexpected hit with the Canadians. And this is a red um, suit by Pierre Cardin. The dress matched the Mounties uniforms. The Canadians all felt that it was an extremely considered diplomatic gesture that she'd, you know, match the suit to the outfit. Jacqueline Kennedy continued with the president to Vienna where he had a day of very unproductive summit meetings with uh, Khrushchev, the sort of feisty Soviet premier, who appeared to melt a little where he met Jacqueline Kennedy wearing an Oleg Cassini design dress. It was great. She picked me. That was the greatest thing to happen in my life. Then I did a good job. That was the second greatest thing I did in my life. This Oleg Cassini design coat was worn by Jacqueline Kennedy when she arrived in New Delhi. She was greeted by Nehru, and the coat in a way reflects the lines of his eponymous Nehru jacket. She changed into exactly the same coat and hat, but in white, to go and lay flowers on Gandhi's shrine. White, of course, is an Indian color of mourning, and one sees that she's established this pattern of complementary clothing. 
This is a dress by uh, Gustave Tassel that Jacqueline wore for an elephant ride in Jaipur with her sister. And although it's got a fuller skirt than she normally wears, that's about the only concession to um, a planned elephant ride. Jacqueline Kennedy's state evening clothes were very formalized. They were rather stiff and almost two-dimensional in a way. But at one point, she wrote to Oleg Cassini asking him to design her a sort of drapey dress in the Madame Grey tradition. She appealed to all women, all different parts of her, the things that she wore, her glasses, her handbags, her, everything. Dark glasses were such a, a, a trademark of, of Jacqueline Kennedy's, and she sort of later said that she felt um, protected by them in a way because she could see what was going on, but people couldn't really see what was going on behind them. I hope people come away thinking that she's more than just fashion. She's greatly missed, but I think she's smiling down on her family tonight. Women have come to terms with the fact that they can be feminine and powerful and strong and intelligent at the same time. I love Wonder Woman's outfit. That's the one I want to wear. Look at this. It's like the movie stuff. I feel like Cinderella. You know, it's it's one of the most elegant uh, nights in uh, in the whole industry. Uh, New York is just lit up by by this incredible event to celebrate a genius in, in our industry. The genius being celebrated by the Metropolitan Museum of Arts Costume Institute was that of Alexander McQueen. Hollywood heavyweights mingled with the fashion elite on the red carpet and all paid tribute to the late British designer. I miss him. I think he was, he's a, he was a brilliant designer and very provocative and creative, perfect balance of both. And I think that the fashion world is really missing that right now. His legacy, this is just the beginning. And he would be very happy for this to be happening tonight. The exhibition inside, entitled Savage Beauty, examined the work of Lee Alexander McQueen, who was one of the fashion world's most acclaimed and provocative talents. The show's really um, based around McQueen's engagement with um, 19th century romanticism. Um, I always felt that McQueen's life and his fashions unfolded like a, a Byronic sort of poem. Um, so, and he was deeply romantic in, in the Byronic sense of the word. The themes of the exhibition are uh, structured around recurring themes in McQueen's work, but themes that also were very prevalent to the romantic movement. Um, so things like nature, um, exoticism, primitivism, nationalism. And these are all themes that McQueen um, would engage with deeply throughout his career, but were also reflected um, by artists and writers of the 19th century romantic movement. This gallery is primarily looking at McQueen's um, methods of cut and construction. He was an extraordinary craftsman and he trained on Savile Row and so knew the skills of his trade um, very well. And I think because he knew them so intimately, he was able to subvert them and upend those, th those um, details. And I think what's interesting about his tailoring is how he was able to, in a way, combine the rigors of tailoring with the spontaneity and playfulness of dressmaking, which you see in this particular piece behind us with the hard shoulder, the nipped in waist but then the deconstructed skirt and I think it's because he knew how to make clothes um, so, so intimately that he was able to subvert those practices. You're very conscious of, um, of showing a legacy um, that is true to, to, true to him and true to who he was as a designer and luckily um, because all, all of his team um, are still um, together we were able to work with people like Sarah Burton so it's great having access to Sarah to find out about McQueen's design process so just in our conversations um, I learned so much about how McQueen would construct a collection and how his fashions came together. Sarah Burton currently at the helm of the label, was on hand to talk about her experience working with McQueen. When I walked into the exhibition, I thought of Lee. The emotion, passion, and attention to detail he had for everything that he did. 
The Sunday that he walked along the beach at Fairlight and came to work on the mo Monday morning with bags full of razor clam shells. The studio smelt like the sea. I'm very proud and honored to have worked for him. He truly was a genius. Collection after collection, McQueen always knew how to put on a show. And everyone has a favorite McQueen moment. One of my favorite collections um, was a, a show called Number 13, which ended with, with, with Shalom Harlow rotating on a turntable with these robotic, or this robot spray painting her. And that was the first collection I went to. The dress, which was all red bugle beads going into a mask, which is extraordinary. A moment when he did all like the feathers, painted feathers, all the bright, beautiful colors like reds, yellows, greens, and blues. I thought it was pretty amazing. Obviously, the the Kate hologram, and which they reproduced so beautifully on that reduced scale, it's miraculous. That was really special. But I mean, it was just one visceral experience after another. Really phenomenal. I think that he would often tap into our, our fears, our hopes, our desires, and would reflect them in his fashions. And the fact that he would also challenge um, normative conventions of beauty. You know, McQueen was very much about um, looking at alternative notions of beauty, um, distinction or difference. And I think he would up upend and challenge our, our expectations of, of beauty. What Vivian Westwood did for punk is like what Chanel did for like a tweed jacket. This is sensational on many levels. It's just a celebration of the construction, the craft, his emotional engineering. The first Monday in May, Hollywood's A-list bring their fashion A-game to New York for the definitive red carpet event of the year, the Metropolitan Museum of Arts Costume Institute Gala. In 2015, China, through the looking glass, explored China's influence on Western fashion and celebrated the grandeur of Chinese culture. I co-made this dress with Tommy Hilfiger team, so it's really one of a kind, custom-made couture. Really looked at a lot of different inspirations of Chinese fashion and Chinese beauty and Chinese women. The jewelry is made out of Chinese gambling chips. For this expression, they have a Chinese fashion, Chinese culture, Chinese art. Everything's here, so I mean, it's really an honor to be here and to see everyone here. Well, I really want to go to China. I really, really want to go. I, I'm, I'm, I'm dying to, to visit because I know it's, it's another world there. But apart from that, I know nothing. So tonight, some education. The exhibition, which spanned three floors, was the largest fashion exhibition the Costume Institute had ever produced. The size of the exhibition is commensurate with its narrative arc, which explores the history of the influence of Chinese aesthetics on the Western fashionable imagination. Our story begins in the mid 18th century, when the influence of Chinese-themed imagery, or chinoiserie, was at its height. The story unfolds through careful juxtapositions of Western fashions and Chinese costumes and decorative arts. These dialogues are not only mutually enlightening, but they also encourage new aesthetic interpretations and broader cultural understandings. The pace of the show unfolds cinematically. In some cases, the rooms are personal and intimate, such as the galleries devoted to Chinese silk, calligraphy and blue and white porcelain. In other cases, they're dramatic and theatrical, such as the gallery devoted to Peking Opera and the gallery devoted to Wuxia. Each gallery contains a film or series of films that relate to its theme and content. Film is frequently the first lens through which Western designers encounter Chinese imagery, and the exhibition explores the impact of movies in shaping their fantasies. Internationally renowned Chinese filmmaker Wong Kar Wai served as artistic director of the exhibition. With China through the looking glass, we have tried our best to encapsulate over a century of cultural interplay between the East and the West that has equally inspired and informed. It is a celebration of fashion, cinema, and creative liberty. Perhaps 
the most well-known film is Wong Kar Wai's In the Mood for Love, which features an array of exquisite Ji Pao's, including versions with Matisse-like floral designs in muted tones. No one's made the Ji Pao look quite as stunning on screen as Wong Kar Wai. Well, it's just so multi-layered and, and it's ever kind of evolving. The Galliano Dior pieces in the Astor Court just look incredible together. The Travis Banton's dress for Anime Wong is phenomenal. And of course, the robes that were literally made for and worn by the emperors in the 18th, 19th and early 20th century in the Anna Winter Costume Court downstairs are just incredible. And then, so interesting seeing them juxtaposed with 20th and 21st century designers' um, reinterpretations. What I love about this exhibition is it shows how present day designers are inspired by China, but that as you see the depth of the exhibition, you get a sense that China has always been there and that China has been influencing Western taste, Western fashion, certainly for the last couple of hundred years. But now people can encounter Chinese art that has a 5,000 year history. So I think part of the excitement for me is that by having this exhibit in the Chinese galleries, people will say, I want to come back and see, experience more about China.